Congratulations, you made it to the stage two. And uh, already, you know, salute your fortitude. I'm very much tired than that. What I, all I was doing was just walking around and talking about stuff I think I know. And then, you know, if, if something is new to you, it's definitely hard. Hopefully, your fortitude and sacrifice will, will be well rewarded. If not today, on Friday, we will be going to run some simulations together. And before we run some simulations together, let us discuss what the hell the simulation codes are already doing inside. So we might later you know, understand better uh, when we don't know about one of those codes from the web page and see, oh dear, it has 150 source codes, the source files, so we're doing different things. But maybe some names like P and periodic things become, start to become familiar after today's lecture, so we maybe understand better. That's my goal. Uh, so, right, so we have the problem. We want to solve the equations of motions, so we need forces. But before we get forces, well, we need, well, we need to get forces. Uh, so we need to solve the gravity, which is the Poisson equation. So the distribution of densities, the source, the potential. If you differentiate the potential, then you have uh, forces. And if you have forces, you might be able to do something with the forces, like later time integrate and push the particles. So how we should do this? So one of the simplest way is the particle mesh method. And as I said, you will see how simple it is. And with a little bit of effort, you might have a chance to write a simple PM code, particle mesh code, yourself uh, doing some small stuff, just you know, solving gravity for, I don't know, orbiting star or solar system, if you like. Well, you will see that it has a few limitations, but it's very simple. So gravity is described by the Poisson equation, and Poisson equation can be solved in real space using the convolution of the density field with the Green's function. If you remember from your calculus uh, course, if you have it, the Green's functions are so-called response functions for the differential equations, and the Green's functions for the Poisson equations are unknown, and you can do this by basically uh, writing that the real space Gaussian potential is the convolution of the rho, here is the density, and the Green's function that takes the argument just the positions uh, in the, in, of the particle in the box. Now, uh, okay, very good. So we can write example here for the vacuum boundary conditions that actually Mark Bichetta mentioned, which we don't use mostly in simulation. Although, when we already since we already discussed the boundary conditions, which are boundary problems uh, are important in physics, you know, we take this trick that we use periodic boundary conditions, assuming that you know. Scale is sufficiently large, the universe is homogeneous. So basically, you know, by saying that, okay, you take a 100 megaparsec box and everywhere outside of this is the same box, we don't make a big mistake because there shouldn't be much different structures on those scales. We are limited to this scale and, and, and this, is, this is just a bit of trick because the really universe is, of course, not periodic, at least not observable. Although, statistically speaking, there is a homogeneity, homogeneity uh, homogeneity scale in the universe. But we might also solve the vacuum boundary condition uh, simulations if you, let's say, one day say, okay, I've seen this cosmic web too many times, I just want to study more or less two, ga two galaxies, I smash them together, I want to be particle physics for galaxy formation for a difference, I'm going to take a few galaxies, change the impact factors and smash them together, see what happens. Well, for this you need boundary, vacuum boundary condition because you don't care what happens outside of this galaxy system, and then you will have to write this Green's function. You see, the Green function for the vacuum vacuum boundary condition is just an invert of the distance among the amplitude. If you wonder how the Green function looks like uh, if you implement vacuum boundary condition, then you have a sine wave basically in the in the in the uh, uh, denominator. Okay, so. Of course, again, we do not go to Fourier space because we love Fourier space in simulations and in calculation because, you know, everything becomes simpler. Not everything. Some things become simpler or simpler. But the most important and fundamental, uh, very useful property of the Fourier space is that convolutions become multiplications. And this makes solutions of, finding solutions of different equations much, much simpler. So in Fourier space, the Fourier, uh, the Fourier uh, uh, component of the Gaussian potential 
is just the product of the Green function, Fourier, Fourier, uh, Fourier uh, <coughs> version of the Green's functions and the Fourier component of the density, which is written here. So now to solve the equation is very simple. First, you fast Fourier transform uh, forward density, you get the Fourier uh, components of the density field. Multiply this Fourier uh, density field, Fourier, Fourier position of density field by the Green's function. Invert fast Fourier transfer back to get the real density, and you have you to get the potential because you already multiplied the Green's, Green's function. So you solve the problem equation, and you get the real space potential. So this is basically this is it. This is actually very, very simple, especially if you have a fast Fourier transfer library, which is very fast these days. So the particle mesh algorithm for solving Laska structure interactions in gravity in cosmology would consist of four steps that are listed here. First, you need to get density from this particle mode, right? Because you need these density components to Fourierize them. Then you compute the potential by inverse Fourier transfer, so by Fourier transport, multiplying by Green's function, inverse Fourier transform back, you have potential. Then you need to differentiate the potential because forces are the minus gradient of the potential. And then the last step would be assign the forces to particles so you know the force acting on each particle. This would be the main component, and then what is left would be the advanced system in time, which is a separate problem that we'll cover a bit later because first we want to discuss different, uh, different methods here. So, density assignments. Okay, this is also important because you know, it doesn't happen on its own, and, and we just have the particles in the box. And, and, and by the way, particle mesh uh, here comes from the fact that you have mesh and you compute all these Fourier components and density components on some kind of a grids. And then, of course, the size of this mesh limits your force uh, accuracy probably much more severely than, than the softening you would have to introduce. So let's, let's compute density. While well, you have this mesh, you have a set of discrete mesh centers, which are this, this, this described by this X, and uh, arrays, and the size of the mesh is small h. So the common uh, way to approach this is just to give some kind of a shape function to a particle. Well, let's call it Sx. And then each mesh cell will be assigned some of the fraction of the mass of the particle uh, uh, that lies in the corresponding cells or the shape of this particle, depending on the shape function, that you find overlapping of the cell. It will become apparent very soon. Uh, well, this is hard mathematics, but it's going to be very simple. So W, this capital W, is just the weight uh, that you uh, ass assign to a given mesh cells, given some of the particle load. So it's just integral from the half of the next mesh center to the, to the next mesh center. Basically, this is just by h over 2. And this is integral of this shape function. And basically, then you can change it with, the, with this capital pi function, which is, a, is defined as, the, um, as being 1 if you have a particle that is inside uh, the particle, particle per center, because particle has the shape inside the cell or outside, it's 0 outside. And then you have convolution. So basically, this is this assignment function called pi times the particle shape s, and this allows you to basically you need to pick up the shape function. But once you have this, you have a particle load. You know where the particle centers are, where the particles you find in the simulation. You know where the mesh centers are, and then basically for each mesh cells, you can just iterate how many particles you find in this region, and you can assign the mass. Uh, so basically, the density is just the sum of all the particles that you, with their weights, contributing to the mesh cells. This math is complicated, but if I would show you the code to do this, it would, it would be much simpler. So maybe let me just show you this table, which is the the, the commonly involved uh, shape of the particles. And actually, nearest grid point is the simplest one, the simplest, most one of the simplest to understand. So let's say we have this computational domain a piece of our simulation box. Of course, I reduced myself to, to, to not myself, the, the, the problem to two dimensions, because I cannot sketch so well in the perspective. So we have some mesh, right? And now we have the particles. 
Let's use a different color. Now oh, some master cluster, there is a big void inside, so no particles here. A few here. How we did some evolved density uh, distribution, right? We have some particles. Right. So nearest big points tells you that the particles have no shapes, they are just really particles. So you only assign mass of this particle to a cell in which you find this particle. This will be very simple. I just go and count. One, two, three particles. Density is three here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Two, one, zero. One, two, three, four, zero. And two, two, one, one. Of course, this is this number tells you how many particles you find, right? And these particles have some mass. Uh, the cells have some dimensions, so you can easily translate this to the density. Uh, normally, in code, we don't work in the physical units. We have many transmissions, so we actually work on the... Uh, we get the density uh, in terms of the bundle density of the whole box, which is usually why we pick up to be unity, so there's a fraction. But this is just the just numerics. Now, if you have a different shape, let's say this uh, cloud in cell, then I say that uh, this particle has kind of this shape, something like that, right? So you see, I find the product overlapping with this cell, so it will probably be something like 80%. So 80% of the mass is to added to this cell, but only like 10% of this particle mass to this cell. Well, because this this part, and maybe just fraction here, right? And and basically then you know the density is just a sum over all the shapes of the particles and how much of the the the, the, the assigned shape functions overlap with a given cell. This big contribution. You know, nearest big point is very fast, but it has some not so great uh, properties because, uh, you know, because if you have go, go to the low density regions, first of all, it's easy to obtain many zero density cells, and this is not so good for the numerical reasons. Second of all, remember, we do the Monte Carlo, so we just randomly kind of assume something by shooting uh, down the line manifold. So let's say one time step, let's say I have a particle very close to the boundary. So I have a density of two. But in the next time step, this particle moves just just tiny bit and just by rounding up, it now is assigned to this cell. So by just one tiny small step, the density here drops by half. Because now I have only one particle here. Here it just increased to five. But you know, if you have this nearest grid point, it's really prone to small number of particle fluctuations. So it might be better uh, use some bigger, uh, more involved shape function. So there's a cloud of cells. That in this involves eight cells, and uh, basically, um, the basically then you have some kind of boxes and triangle shaped clouds that involves of 27 ne nearby cells and smears out the particle. Um, you can find the formulas exactly for this uh, for this uh, very easily. And it depends what you want to do, how kind of a density field you expect to obtain, you can choose one of those. But even if you stay with nearest grid point, you already got them to get some very fast uh, uh, estimation of the density. All right. So you have density, you Fourier transfer it, multiply by the Green's function, inverse it, you have a potential. What do you do with the potential? Well, you need to now differentiate the potential to get the forces, right? This is the second uh, law of, of, of Newton dynamics, or well, some equation of motion, basically, for the particles. Force is, uh, well, just force, it's not an equation of motion for it. Force is just the minus gradient of the potential. So let's say you have this grid and you have this particle. How you can get the uh, answer, what force acts on this particle? Well, you need to fill it, uh, uh, differentiate this potential to basically get the numerical approximation to this gradient. So you can use second order accurate scheme, or you can use fourth order accurate scheme, or whatever you choose. In cosmology, mostly we use fourth order cosmology accurate schemes for this simplified algorithm because the, the error that comes from the density assignment is, is actually become larger than the error by truncating uh, the forces. So you finally differentiate the potential on the grid cells, and you have a force. Now what is left to do? You need to interpolate the forces back onto the particle locations. 
And that's the important step that we <coughs> you want to use exactly the same assignment scheme to the forces that you use for the density. Because if you do assignment scheme, you might start to have some anisotropic um, fluctuations of the force that will be not physical and then can lead, lead to the completely arbit uh, artificial or numerical uh, anisotropic stress and things like that. So once you decide on one particle density assignment scheme, use the same to interpolate back the forces to the particle positions. The pro so it's very fast algorithm. You see, you can do it probably, you know, a little bit of coding. Take some particle load, define some mesh, assign density, fast Fourier green, inverse fast Fourier the potential, differentiate potential to get, you get the forces at each grid cells and then you find the particle, like in this example here, you use the same kind of a shape to, to draw forces from nearby cells. So if this is nearest grid point, this means to this particle only first force that is evaluated at this cell, right? Because it was assigned to this cell. If this is like cloud and cells, then you might involve more nearby forces to, to take the, uh, some average contribution to the force. Okay, uh, so what are the advantages of this? And this advantage of this very, very simple particle mesh scheme. Particle mesh because you have only mesh and only particles, nothing else in this method. So it's very fast and it's very simple. It's very good for the internet. So that's what props. But there are many cons. And the cons are basically the special resolution of the force field is limited to the, to the mesh you pick up, right? You might think, okay, I will go, go with much, much, much finer mesh. Let's say, uh, well, mesh is only defines once. Uh, it does nothing happen during simulation to the mesh. I keep the same mesh in my memory, just update the values. Why not use, you know, 10 times finer mesh? Things like that. Well, you have a big problem because many of times we'll have completely empty cells. First of all, uh, zero density is unphysical. In the universe, there's no place in the universe where there's no density, where there's density is zero. It can be, can be very low, uh, but not zero, right? I mean, at least in cosmological scales, you always have some hydrogen and dark matter particles in a given region of space. So zero, zeros are really dangerous because they can provide you uh, points when the, when the density really fluctuates unphysically. But also, you're going to spend, you know, many times computing densities and forces of, of, of empty cells because you don't know a priori where they are. So it's not very efficient to just use much, much, much denser, you know, finer mesh to get better resolution. And the forces become somewhat, uh, errors on the forces become somewhat anisotropic on the, skies, on the scale of the cell size. And this is not very good because this means the problem is not invertible in time. This means basically that once you run the simulation, once you run the simulation, uh, if you want to retrace back in time, you won't be able to get the same answer. You won't get back to initial conditions. And we should be able to have this completely, you know, invertible problem because of the energy conservations. Because it's very hard to trace energy conservation if your forces errors are are somewhat anisotropic like this. So there are these are these are cons of this method. Uh, nonetheless, you know, uh, well, this is. No. Nonetheless, this method is very simple, and if you want to only get the forces on the large scales for some reason, you might implement this method, you're going to get them very fast and very cheap. Modern laptops can do fast Fourier transfer in the grids like that with each with grids of 1024 cube particles, uh, 1024 cube cells. You can run simulation with this method like that on your laptop, and you're going to get some, some results. And you, here you have a illustration of the density field, evolved density field from the particle mesh uh, load. But if you want to really study the structure formation on many levels of nonlinearity and you go from the things like small galaxies to the large scale voids, you probably need to do something smarter than just this. Well, uh, first, next very simple uh, improvement to the particle mesh method is the particle-particle mesh uh, method, which is called P3M, uh, because particle, particle, particle mesh. That's why the 3P comes from that. So here the idea is the following. Supplement the particle mesh force, which is the crude, uh, low resolution force, with the direct summation force inside one cell, right? So 
On some sites, I get the last reports, but I don't uh, use contribution from this potential field here. I just compute directly the force that will be from the particle load inside this one cell. So large scale forces get from particle mesh, mesh. Small scale forces you compute in which in each cells by directly summing uh, and solving the potential. So offers much higher numerical range, but becomes very slow when the clustering of structure kicks in uh, in simulation. So for the first, you know, some redshifts from 100 to redshift 10, let's say, you can be, you can get away with that, but as soon things like clusters start to form, you can galaxy cluster halos, you have so many particles in one mesh that this becomes very, very um, uh, problematic. Although it was used with, with success already in the 90s to get nice high resolution simulations, you can improve this a bit by using something which is called adaptive mesh refinement <coughs> placed on the clustered regions. The idea is the following, that you use the particle mesh in large scales and then you have some, some criteria. Let's say, okay, if I have more than eight particles in a cell, oh, I'm in the clustered region, I better put finer, smaller mesh around this region when I have these high, high particles. And this allowed me to go inside and basically compute forces on smaller number of particles. But the problem with adaptive mesh refinement is that as soon as you move from the main grid, when you have a periodic boundary condition, you cannot longer use fast Fourier transform and the Green's function to solve potential because you don't longer have periodic boundary condition on the small mesh. You need to use different methods for this. And, and, and this means that the method becomes more complex and intrinsic. But AP3N is another method that had been used in the 90s and 2000s, especially like Hydra by Coachman Code is, is one of the very good examples of this to get kind of a, you know, uh, low resolution forces using particle mesh and this speed up and get, still get a quite nice high resolution using adaptive mesh refinement. However, since we are already here and discussing adaptive mesh refinement, this kind of a approach made its way to cosmology, uh, especially in the last 10 years when we become uh, acquainted with many, let's say, modified gravity and dynamical dark energy models. So models in cosmology that were not standard, but they have some kind of evolving scalar field that would act upon the matter distribution. And, uh, you know, part adaptive particle mesh is one of the best suited methods to solve for the scalar field, which scalar field is just a field that doesn't cluster like particles. So that's why, that's why this, this codes, uh, among others, are very useful. Plus, if you have adaptive mesh refinement method, you can easily implement the same uh, mesh hierarchy you have already for gravity for computing forces, pressures, and hydrodynamical interactions of gas. Because, you know, Olenia, uh representation for gas is much nicer than, than particle representation. Um, for the reasons that you know, you have a much better entropy preserving and shock capturing. So, how do you do if you cannot use fast Fourier transform and Green's function, and you want to still uh, find a uh, solution to the problem equation? Well, there's an iterative process of it's called grid relaxation process of guessing the some some initial solution and then going to the refinement, updating the cells with the, the with the with the what has the equation dictates you and basically looking for a moment until all the improvements or changes to the solution become so small and start oscillate. This is so-called convergence criterion, and this means that you, that you uh, find some kind of solution. So the idea is that you approximate the uh, uh, Laplacian, the one they find the Poisson equation, by the, by the finite difference approximation. This is, the, this is the, uh, one of the common solutions, to, uh, cho cho choices of this. And then you go to your grid, already mesh defined grid, right? And you have some initial guesses for the red, uh, for the red, uh, sorry, for the black uh, and red uh, cells. And then you first start with the red cells. This is called red black uh, update method. It's called also Newton Rapson, I think, for, for, for if you want to be really uh, careful of the names. So you first sweep to the grid, only updating the red cells. 
you know, solving this, uh, this, this finite difference for the Laplacian. And then you go to the black one. It's important to do this uh, iteratively and, uh, and kind of uh, and mutually exclusively, because if you do it at the same time, update all the uh, cells, you won't be able to know if you're approaching uh, the right solution because you're going to have fluctuations uh, that won't uh, die out on the size of the grid cells. That's basically from the stability criteria. So you do this, you oscillate, uh, you, you do this and uh, iterate and try to find, stop this iteration, this relaxation of the grid, uh, once you reach some kind of a predefined uh, convergence criteria. Let's say you know, your, your solution hasn't changed by more than 0.1% in the last few sweeps. Uh, this is much more involved, of course it takes time, and the problem is that the long-range errors, fluctuations, die out very slowly in this relaxation. And this means it takes, you know, errors on small scale cell size very quickly are replenished because you know you update them nearby cells. But on the, you have errors also coming from the large uh, density fluctuation, larger than one cells, and this dies out, die out much slower. And my idea to, to deal with that is that uh, it's called multi-grid um, uh, solver when you have all whole hierarchy of nested grids. And you know, you guess the solution on one level, go to finer mesh cells, guess another solution, feed it back, go to last solution, do something that's called B-cycling. It's become more complicated, I just try to say to you that it's its its, it's own way to solve this. It's fully uh, um, well established, but it's no longer so simple. No longer so simple and usually computationally expensive. The problem is that as soon as you resign fast, fast, from fast Fourier transform, uh, 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 you can do other things, but you lose the simplicity and, and uh, fast uh, algorithmic boost. Uh, but there are some costs that use this: Art, Mal, Amiga, and also uh, uh, Ramses, which is the, from Roman this year, uh, and, and, and I think some other codes as well. I didn't mention all of them here, and it's perfectly okay. To, to use this method in cosmology. And it's, as I said, it's very good if you want to combine this with hydrodynamics on the Eulerian uh, solver. Because if you stick to the, to the standard uh, particle mesh or similar schemes, you, stick, you don't have a adaptive mesh refinements. If you want to do the hydrodynamics, usually you want to do smooth particle hydrodynamics. This is a specific choice, and it has its own problems. OK. But, there's also another approach to solve the plasma equation, and uh, it actually exploits the, one of the most uh, common features we have in the cluster, uh, version of clustering, which is the clustering itself. The particle distribution becomes cluster, so we can arrange the particles in some logical uh, space organized structures, like tree, and use this to fastly find particle distribution locally, and then basically approximate, approximate the, the contribution to the potential from the group of particles by just considering multiples expansion around the center of mass, so basically some first few moments of the shape, um, uh, inertial person distributions. How this would work? Well, direct estimation is the n square, and well, we need many, many particles. So uh, if, we, if we use this tree algorithm and the group particles according to the uh, to the some criteria of arranging them in the in the specially organized uh, tree, you can use this multiple expansion, and then you only need logarithm logar of n calculations to get the forces instead of n squared, and get similar reasonably good accuracy. So that's a huge huge boost in in in. Uh, efficiency of computations. So basically, how you proceed, you basically split the domain and build the tree, and you know, you, whenever you go, to, you know, you first split the box by four, let's say, normally you do the octree, so the, you split the cube by eight subcubes, so but you of course work with the two dimension. And then in each subcube, you, you divide, and you keep dividing until you find particles. As long as you, as soon as you find that there's no particles in a given box, you don't split further, and this is the final uh, node of your, of your tree. And uh, usually, the, also, you do this the same if you find just one particle, this is the termination part. 
And then you can find easily uh, shapes and distance on nearby particles by just walking this tree up and down. So basically how this would normally work, you have levels of this tree, you know, from the main level to, 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 to the smaller level, because you know we always make a division at, the, at each level. And this you use this use this something we call hierarchical multiple expansion. So this is a very simple idea, although the map uh, math and then naming may sound complex. You basically approximate the gravity of you know, force or potential contribution to the distance part of particles by the ex multiple expansion around the center of mass of this group of particles. So we have some bunch of particles. If we are far away, we don't make a big error by just approximating, you know, if this would be a kind of long elongated shape, this would have some, you know, one monopole and quadrupole moment if this would be different. You know, you, you have these moments of the multiple extension and they give you a very simple uh, way to get reasonably good forces. How you do this? Basically, let's say in this problem we want to find the potential created, rational potential created by this bunch of particles on these particles at the at the bottom, which is the green one, and the origin here represents the origin of the of the, of the node of the tree cell or, or whatever cell you have. So basically, the potential norm is just a sum over the invert distances, right, in the masses of the particles. Now we're going to expand this invert of the distance in the multiple expansion. So this is very simple. S is distance to the origin. Xi is the, the uh, position of each particle in the distance uh, group of particles. And R is just the distance from the point at which you compute the forces to the origin. This is usually by the cell of the tree. And so very simple approximation, you can obtain the multiple expansion. So we have a monopole. Then it's a, then we skip the, the, the dipole because dipole basically by definition uh, should vanish because we expand around the center of mass of this bunch of particles. So the dipole is zero. So you have monopole, quadrupole, octopole, but usually you stop at quadrupole, it's in gas, it stops at quadrupole because you already get some uh, good forces. This T is just tra transposition. Uh, operation here, and capital I is just identity unity of the matrix. So, and you can follow the map yourself. Uh, it's very simple, just a simple multiple expansion of the of the center of mass. So, now you compute these multiple moments at each nodes of the tree, and you store them. So, later, if the tree hasn't been updated in the calculations, you don't need to recompute them. You just take the multiple moments. If the particles move on just a little bit, you don't need to actually recompute this. Only when the particles move significantly, you need to reconstruct the tree and recompute the multiples. So this already saves you some time. Plus, of course, you still don't do this for uh, for all the particles. You know, if the particles are far away, you just put multiples. But if the particles are too, too close, let's go back to this example, you might not be safe to use the multiple expansion anymore. So if this theta angle, theta angle, would be too large, it means your particle that you want to compute forces is very close to the, this group of particles that you normally represent as multiple. Multiple expansion is no longer very accurate, and you're probably going to make a big error. So this, theta, so this means you need to split up the particle to smaller groups of particles. So, small so this theta is called the opening angle, and this is one of the fundamental parameters that moderate how the three algorithms operate. Uh, and basically, you know, if the theta is small, you don't uh, go open the tree, you use the multiple of the distance particle group. If the theta is large, you algorithm tells you, okay, I'm going to go and see on the lower level how the particles are distributed and use the multiples here because they are more accurate than this, this, this crude multiples. Uh, once you have this, you take monopole moment, quadruple tensor, and then the resulting potential is just a, just a simple uh, sum of the quadruple and monopole from the tree. And, and you know, and you can do this if you have an efficient tree algorithm to do this. In, in, it's also a nice structure to organize particles in the memory. Uh, well, you can usually efficiently walk the tree and compute the multiples and have the forces computed uh, Exploiting the fact that the, you know, as long as you progress, the matter clusters in the universe. So as I said, you know, it takes only log n 
uh, procedures, log and computations to compute the multiples uh, forces contributions. Additional uh, improvement here would be because here we only admit to the particle multiple interaction, right? We go particle by particle, and locally, let's say we want to have high resolution forces, so we see what kind of a forces or potentials are uh, examined on the particle by some distance group of multiple. You can improve the calculations, optimize them, if you also admit by multiple to multiple interactions. So actually not only just particle and uh, group of particles, but also see how the group of particles would interact with each other. You store this information in the tree, in, and you don't, because you don't need to recreate the tree every time with the simulation, it saves you a lot of the computational power. But uh, this is not uh, something that is done in gadgets. I mean, not until gadget 4, because gadget 4, I think, has this fast multiple uh, method. Uh, just to see more or less. Where's my cursor? How this works. Is this most mm -hmm. So, yes. So, we compute the forces on the black particle. So, from the distance, uh, pieces of the boxes, we just take the multiple, and you know, from the local ones, because the angle is large, we need to open the tree and then use the local uh, multiples. And for the most nearby particles, we just directly compute the, the, the forces from the, the most nearby particles. So it's, 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 you know, even the math looks a bit complicated, the idea is very simple, and, and uh, it's well known from the in comp in comp computational sciences. Uh, I want to compute this again. Sorry, I don't want to show you this again. Right. So, okay. So, yeah. But maybe we don't need to do this Fourier stuff. Just do the tree. Right? It's just relatively fast. Uh, the problem that was quickly recognized and already was existent in the Gadget 1 version of the code which was published in 2001, that it was just pure pre-code. There was no particle mesh, nothing else, no hybrid. We will see that we're going to be interested in hybrid method. Just three algorithms. That at early times in your simulation, the particle load is very homogeneous. You don't have much clustering. This means you need to open the tree nearly all the time because the particles are not clumped together. So locally, you have more or less the same number of particles. So this significantly slows down this algorithm and was really hindrance to its performance. So you might think about, okay, the, the very reasonable thing to do is that since the four, tree uh, algorithm gives me precise forces at the scale of the, of the nearby tree, maybe I don't need to have the whole computer bo uh, computational box in the tree, maybe I can use a very fast particle mesh method that gives me forces at large scales and only locally compute the high resolution forces walking the tree just nearby, a few cells. And this is, this is something we call uh, tree particle mesh method, one of the hybrid method. This was a huge improvement that was invented in Gadget 2. And this actually uh, improvement allowed millennium simulation to be run. Back then using the computers in the early 2000s, um, that wasn't that uh, powerful yet. So here is the example of the, how the problem equation looks when you have periodic peculiar potential and you split the forces. So L is the size of the box here, basically. So what you do, you split the potential of the gravitational potential to the long range force and small uh, uh, scale force contributions. Long range force will be computed from the particle mesh and small scale will be computed from the tree. So plasma equation in three aspects for this basically reads like that. And then we see the phi chi, my, my Fourier uh, component of the, of the potential. For long, uh, I multiply this by the, by the, 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 the minus x function, and for long, sorry, for short, one minus this. And what is this function? This function assures that you don't count the potential twice. It kills long scale potential at small scales, so at small scales, scale smaller comparable to the RS. This is control parameter. RS is we call this kind of a force scaling radius. While in the short, uh, short uh, um, distance case, it assures that these short contributions do not propagate too much beyond the, beyond the one or two grid cells, whatever you choose. And then basically you match them together 
And this, this assures that you basically don't have additional forces because you compute their potential twice from some particular loads. So this is computed. The, the long-range forces are computed using standard particle mesh with some density assignments. You, we discuss this very quick and very fast. And this is basically, you know, fast Fourier transfer to real space, and then you solve in real space by walking between using a fast multiple extension method. And this was a huge boost to, to um, efficiency, as I said. And because the tree is now work only locally. Locally is the just few neighboring grid cells. And the last few forces you get from the, from the whole grid. And this is just, a, this shows you how quickly this function dies out as a scale of the distance divided by this control parameter RS. Basically, already at 5 RS, RS radii, when you go to the below 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6 contribution. Uh, so you need to choose this, this value in such a way that it's not smaller than the, than the one particle uh, main grid mesh size, but also not many, many times larger, because then you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, get uh, improvement by the fact that you would combine these two methods. So basically, it's usually pick up to be, to be you know, a few times the grid uh, cells, and, and, and this is shown to be working quite effectively. So this is the, this is the one main improvement that went to Gadget 2, which is called hybrid form. We call it that, you know, performance gain, because you only work three locally, and you still have a very high, quite res high resolution uh, force uh, calculation. And the uh, forces that you compute on the tree have usually quite well-behaved error pro uh, properties. So the errors in, when we live, I mean, the errors are not correlated, because if they will be correlated, will be really, really, really deep uh, trouble. And, and most of the errors, you know, don't really propagate, don't, don't accumulate that much. So you, you can really you know, integrate the system for, for many, many orbits. Okay. Now, the last thing before we go to initial conditions and time integration is something that is, you know, either called domain decomposition in this code, in, in this nomenclature, or the memory locality, basically how you handle the fact that if you want to really run the big simulation that you will have a merit in scientific uh, investigation, you won't be able to fit this simulation most likely in one computer. You have to distribute it somehow among many CPU, among one CPU, one processor. Either many CPUs that share the same memory, or many CPUs that have their own local memory, that are different polarization schemes, but you need to kind of distribute the the calculations among system because if you keep everything in one place, you're gonna really hinder the, the, the memory efficiency. And even if you can really fit the simulation in one in one one node, it's better to make a domain decomposition from the fact that if you have many CPUs that have the same memory, uh, you know, if you if you split the calculation just you know Okay, I have 10 CPUs, I have a billion of particles, every CPU gets 10%, 100 million particles, and see what happens. Well, some of these 100 million CPUs, uh, particles can actually, by random chance, be in the void, so there will be very quick calculations, and some of them might be actually representing a couple of clusters, or superclusters. Well, this means that the guy who got the supercluster will be always the slowest guy in the class, because he will be just computing, computing, because all this cluster. But all the remaining CPUs will be already ready, saying, okay, give us the forces, we can want to proceed. So this was not smart. So for all these many reasons, you want to split the calculations in a nice way, so you obtain something we call good load balancing. So most of the CPUs, most of the memory system have more or less same amount of particles, same amount of calculations to do. If you can do this for the most of the time you run simulation, you don't waste that much time uh, by waiting for some CPUs, and, and you actually use the machine efficiently. Which is very good because you produce less carbon, carbon dioxide as well, and, and, and it's very good for economy, and the lower uh, electricity usage, you know, energy is very, very expensive. Very expensive. Actually, the Warsaw is closing for one month with supercomputer at Warsaw University next month. 
because for, for that reason, because they found that most people don't do in hours calculations and they think that we can save some money. Well, this means I can run my simulations. So, you know, if I would make them more efficient, then maybe we'll finish before they close down for one more of the So, you know, always you have this in mind back in our head that and try to do as efficient as possible because the big simulation really takes a lot of uh, calculations. So, how we can split, how we can domain decompose our problem to, to, to provide better memory locality, better load balancing. One of the simplest idea, which is of course not perfect given the modern uh, uh, modern computer uh, architecture, but for historical reason I will describe this one, and because you're going to get the idea more or less, is the order part is to order particles by some kind of a space unique space filling curve. So how this works? Basically, for example, we have a Hilbert curve, which is a fractal that fits a, a square. You know, you might say, okay, I have four CPUs, so there you are here. It tells you that, you know, you take this, you can you take this, you take this. But if you say, I, I want to have, you know, 15 nodes, then it tells you if you should fill this. So this means that this fractal changed two-dimensional particle load, whatever you have here, to one-dimensional fractal. Because, you know, you assign particles or calculations or grid source according to the way in which uh, piece of this fractal they in, and then you have a one dimensional fractal, a line, and you can cut it equally by 10, you have 10 CPUs, by 100 pieces, you have 100 CPUs, and this means that more or less all of this uh, CPU should get something similar. And of course, if you, this is to 2D, if you, uh, if you advance this to 3D, then you have a pain of hitting that face, uh, face uh, film curve, and this looks like this. So this is equivalent in, in, in 3D. And it's a nice, there are actually many public libraries that will do this for you, so you don't even need to invent a fast algorithm to, to, to decompose the calculation into this. So number of these nodes of this fractal is something you want to decide. It shouldn't be exactly an equal number of the CPUs. You should probably use um, something that is smaller than the number of particles, but not too small, but also many, much larger than the number of different uh, processors that you have. And then later you just uh, split the, the domain by equally saying maybe this, maybe, maybe, maybe by 10, maybe by 100. It's just a matter of finding the most efficient way to do this. And now how it actually works if you, if you implement this in this tree object. So basically you, you have this kind of Hilbert curve. I'm waiting for my slides to update. And then, you basically, uh, once you split, you compute the tree locally uh, in each pieces of this fractal. So basically, also you know where one of the pieces of the fractal connects to the other. So in, if you have a distributed memory, you immediately know which other CPU guys ask for information if it happens to know that your particles are close to the to the boundary. If you want to split this among the you know, different computers, not even different CPUs. So this is an example that will tell you how it might look like if you have a, uh, five processors and you split this uh, uh, domain decomposition. These are cutting points of the fractal. So this processor zero gets this part, processor one gets this part, and you decide when you cut because you, know, you keep counting how many particles you have along the way. And you, have all, you want all of them more or less have the same particles. So let's say it seems that probably there was some cluster here and there was some cluster here and there was a lower density here. So this number one gets more of the cells but get the same amount of calculations because he gets the same amount of particles. So there's one way to do this domain decomposition. There are many other ways uh, but you need to do some kind of this in order to be able to run efficiently this one supercomputer. So Gadget uses the same Hilbert. Gadget 4 is something that tries to be smarter. Uh, basically, the field is, is deep and big, and it's open problem in computational um, sciences. I'm just mentioning this for you, so you understand that this is additional process that happens here if you want to have efficient parallel calculations. Uh, I want to give you a, maybe a very short intermission about the COLA method, which is the not full and body simulation method 
but it's a different kind of approximate hybrid method that is very useful if you want to generate large-scale structure, many different mock catalogs, because it's very, very fast. It, it's still reasonably accurate. It's not good enough to study those small-scale structures, warp galaxy formation, warp halos. But if you want to make many, many mocks, big large-scale structures, something like Euclid would probably observe, this is a nice method. And it's kind of a hybrid method because it does a little bit of particle mesh and perturbation theory. It's actually very smart. So COA stands for a co-moving Lagrangian accelerator. And the C, the parallel version, is called PICOLA, as the paper uh, uh, <coughs> in archive. And PICOLA, you can download it, it's easy to compile. And you know, I run. Uh, so let, just to tell you that I run 8 billion particle simulation on gadget or a repo that took, let's say, a week of computations on, on the same number of CPUs, Cora finished in 4 hours. So this is the difference. Of course, you'll see very soon that this speed up comes with a huge sacrifice. So the idea here is that basically you use the Lagrangian perturbation theory, usually on the, on the second order, high order, to compute the, the, the deflections of the particle orbits. And this is supplemented in between with some number of just simple n body steps from the, from the uh, uh, particle mesh. So you use the Lagrangian perturbation theory that connects the basic potential, something we call in Lagrangian perturbation theory displacement field. With the with the particle uh, particle position, so you, you here is the equation of motion, right? So this is the gradient of of the potential. This is the second order time derivative of the displacement field from Lagrangian perturbation theory. Basically, you count, uh, you uh, call out takes into account first and second order. So it's like a second order Lagrangian perturbation theory. So it's not the linear order anymore. Something. Sometimes we call it weekly nonlinear regime. So it takes the higher order contributions, some equations here, but I just want to show you this sketch. So normally, basically, second order Lagrangian perturbation theory will tell you that the particle, basically in perturbation theory, in Lagrangian perturbation theory, particles move in ballistic motion. And basically, the last structure potential tells you how much you should basically curve the uh, orbit. Right? So you start with the starting point and then. So you would end up here. But you know it's just approximation because of perturbation theory. So you take this as a first guess, and then at each time step, you compute extra displacement correction due to n body force. So you can compute just pure particle mesh, very fast code. So you can use time, 10 time steps, for example, to get kind of a much more uh, realistic orbit of a particle. No. Normally, you would overshoot. This would be the difference between perturbation theory and the uh, acceleration method. And uh, let me skip this maybe detail in conscious of time. Uh, but I wanted to show you just a picture. Oh yes. So forget the text maybe because well the the, the, the fact is that if you want to run full and body, this would be no. This would be order of thousand time steps. With the color method on large scales, you can get similar result. Uh, Similar accuracy with just 10 time steps, right? And here's the here's the uh, comparison. This is the second order Lagrangian perturbation theory of three time steps, so three intermediate orbit or displacement calculations. You see, basically, you get blurry and some kind of a. Uh, this is definitely not a proper hair. It's very very fuzzy. Cola, 10 time steps. You see, you have a filament, you have some halos, you have some small halos. Gadget. The same initial part, the, the, the same initial conditions, 2,000 time steps. Of course, this is comparison by eye, so they look oh amazing. They look the same. Why we not? Let's not run the body simulation anymore. They are very expensive. We just use Cola. Well, this is a cherry picky because this is a galaxy cluster, and uh, at this resolution they look similar. But you really see that the Cola sacrifice accuracy, and they cannot really well. Uh, resolve internal properties of halos, internal orbits. So once the, you know, once the orbit becomes non-linear or complicated, the color of fails miserably. But if you want to just find where should be more or less halos and, and galaxies inside those halos in large-scale structure and run thousands of boxes very fast to generate more galaxy catalog or something like that, the color method is, is quite good at this. 
Okay, now the big thing, uh, going back to the embodied methods we discuss, there are different methods, right? three, particle mesh three, um, multi-grid solvers, just particle mesh, particle particle. It doesn't matter which one you choose, all they do, they give you the answer, what are the forces acting on particles given the initial particle load. But the method themselves, we didn't say anything about how to move an evolved system in time. For this, you need to integrate the equation of motion, and this is usually a completely separate problem, and it's not trivial. So, the thing is that in cosmology, usually the forces are not very accurate. You know, we already use many approximations, so we know that you know that the forces are not very accurate, but that's okay because most of the uh, halos, subhalos, and the particles we find in simulations in the Hubble time do at least a few orbits, two, three, four, maybe five, depends of course, and on what scales. Of course, if you go to stars, maybe you can go to 20 orbits inside galaxies. But this means that even the forces are not so very accurate, uh, you don't need to be very precise with time integration because you don't have that many orbits to, to, to solve. So this favors low order integration schemes, and now, which is the contrast because if somebody study, for example, uh, tower dynamics and want to study globular clusters or stellar clusters, they cannot just use low order integration scheme that I will show in a moment because because they need to have thousands of orbits probably or hundreds of orbits, right? So this means that they need to be much much accurate. So it's crucial in our time integration that we're gonna use operators to do the time integration. Uh, that uh, are Hamiltonian. Because non-Hamiltonian operators have very unwanted properties that have very bad energy conservation, for example, properties. So we need to use Hamiltonians. And usually in this cosmology, we uh, approximate the full particle Hamiltonian, but by Hamiltonian that is se separable into kin kinetic part and potential part. And this allows us to introduce two time operators. Two things, two different operators that are going to be doing two different things as a function of time and they're going to act in particle. We have a drift and kick time operators. So they look like this. Uh, hmm. D is a drift operator, it acts on the time step, delta takes time step. K is the kick operator, it also acts on the time step. Then basically, this is the integral over the kinematic or potential part of the Hamiltonian. So you see, drift operator does nothing to the particle uh, momentum, it updates the particle position. It takes the particle momentum, which is going to go from the, you get from the force field, by the time step and updates the position. Now the kick operator does nothing to particle position, but updates particle uh, momentum, basically by just swimming the forces and applying the force field. And if you combine them in a smart way, you might have a very nice time integration scheme. So most common, commonly we have drift, kick, drift, or kick, drift, kick. So DKD or KDK, depends what you want. So you have a full time step operator. You first do the drift at half time step, kick at full time step, and again drift at half time step. So we see in total you did the drift at full time step and kick at full time step. Uh, or you can have a kick at half time step, drift at, half, at half, full time step, and kick at half time step. I know it's late, sorry for this. The thing is that we want to integrate equations of motions of the multi-particle system and we want to do it in a way that the energy is conserved as best as, as precisely as we can. Because if we have if we screw up our energy conservation, we're gonna have a wrong orbit, you're gonna have system of gains or loose energy or nothing, and it's not, not very good. So, that, uh, so yeah, not accurate enough time integration can lead to uh, that, that every, even very small uh, error will accumulate very quickly over the time steps and will lead to completely unphysical behavior of our model system. So, here's the example. Let's say you don't have sophisticated kick, kick drift kits. And, uh, or drift, kick, drift. So you don't have this half uh, momentum uh, full position update or half position full momentum updates in kind of a three separate uh, pieces of the time step. We just use Runge Kuta. Why not? We can, we can use the Runge Kuta, second order, seems okay. 
Well, that's an example. What happens if you use the Runge Kuta? It's a very simple model, uh, system. We have a fixed potential, mass potential, and, part, and particle of an orbit. There's an extrasity of, extras, extrasity of the orbit, 0 0.5. And you see, after 51 orbit, orbit looks like that. Right? It, it, it actually decays, and the energy uh, system is gaining energy because orbit becomes, is becoming all, uh, larger. It's only, you know, only every 10th orbit is drawn. So you compute more or less 5,000 forces per orbit, and you have 280 steps per orbit. So it's quite, you know, it's quite accurate the number of time steps, but you see something is wrong happening in the system. At the same time, the same system, you see what happens to the orbit if you use drift kick drift or kick drift kick kick. And the viable and very very much important thing is the very variable time step. Anyway, DKD. Much better than Runge Kuta, but still not perfect. You see something is happening with the orbit, even though it should be always the same orbit. This is a very simple system. Point mass potential and point mass orbiting uh, this, this, this fixed potential. Nothing happens. This, if the system will be integrated in fact perfectly, we should always see this equation. Well, okay, we have something here. It's still not perfect, but you know, it's much better that one orbit than all these two combined. By the way, this, this part was in Gadget 1. So you see, you know, this is ancient code, you always learn as we go. Now mostly, most of the codes use kick, drift, kick, and variation of the kind of leapfrog and, and more complicated uh, time steps. So see also what happens with the energy of the system. So this was this Runge Kuta. You see, time integration gave rise to artificial gain of the energy of the system. That's why orbit become, became larger and larger. It's completely unfeasible, right? And you see, very quickly, after a few times that you can get 20% boost of energy from now. This is completely unphysical, and in cosmology, this could lead, for example, to heat up of the halos or, you know, moving up galaxies, something that should never happen. In the two remaining, you see, actually, this, this, this thing is losing energy, slower than this is gaining, but it's not perfectly. With KDK, you might think maybe to 100 orbits, we're not so bad. To 50 orbits, you're still within, you know, a few percent of the energy conservation, which is good enough, good enough for most of the cosmological application because 50 orbits is a quite, quite a lot uh, for a system that we study uh, in computer simulations. So if we implement this, so now we know, let's say we pick up kick, drift, kick, we know we have this time operation, and so it looks again, I will show you, and remind you, oh, not too quick. Ah. Okay, it looks like this. So we take the particle load, compute density, compute forces, add the tree, particle mesh, whatever. Uh, now we have forces. So we can update particles. We do this time step, uh, which is this operator, right? And once we update the particle positions and, and moments, we have a new particle load. And that's the next time for the simulation. We compute the density again, compute forces, and move on. And move on until we want to stop. We want to stop at ratio zero, whatever ratio, because separately you have to keep track of the background, of course. But now we can really integrate system in time. So now we have something that allows us to do the simulation dynamically. Not just, just one time step, one time step forces, but just multiple time steps. The important thing is that how to choose this uh, delta t. I didn't mention. So if you use delta t that is fixed, it's not very good because in simulations, in cosmology, quickly you will see that as in regions when the halos form, you have something that we call neuralization, you know, particle velocities can be very, very fast. On average, on one of scales, like you know, we learn from the German lecture, it's average 500 kilometers per second. Right? So the particles can move quite quickly. On the larger scales, you know, you can also have particles, so that particle moves much, much slower. So if you use the fixed time step, you're going to have plenty of particles that are uh, either overshooting, because you use the too crude time step, or if you use too small time step, you can, you're going to integrate orbits of these fast moving particles well, but you're going to waste huge amount of time of very slowly moving particles. Because you don't need to recalculate the orbit of the very slowly moving particles so often. So one thing that I don't have a slide to show you, but I just want to mention in passing, that the last improvement you can make here is the 
variable time step. So first of all, you can have a time step limiter that says, okay, if I'm gonna make my time step smaller if I have a fast particle, but at some point I start stop because I don't have uh, too small time step. So as the simulation goes, time step gets smaller. But second thing you also can do, you can split your particles in the integration of time and have the different time step for different particles. For slow moving particles, you have uh, large time steps, so you update them every often, at some point, every now and then, much, much, much less frequent. And for fast moving particles, you have a much smaller time step. This means that there's still a problem because at the given time, particles are not synchronized with each other. So if you want to say, okay, now I want to know what happens in my simulation, I stop calculation, and now I reach redshift 2, and I want to save my simulation redshift 2, you need to bring all the particles of different time steps together, so this takes some interpolation, uh, so it's another new one. But just to be reminded that you see, there's a little lock underneath the hood to get this machinery right. So we cover forces um, solving uh, potential and uh, integrating system in time. Uh, now, what we would like to discuss is also how to generate initial conditions, how we can start the simulation, right? So what we have code that can run, because we don't know about that for a repo or a Swift, how I can start my simulation to, to have the universe I want to have, to give it these initial conditions so it produces these nice pictures. Well, you need to make initial conditions. And there are many ways to do this, but most traditionally we use perturbation theory, Lagrangian perturbation theory, and the most common system method to do this is called the Zeldovich approximation. So the, in the real universe, the mass definition was close to uniform, and the growth of fluctuations can be approximated, as I showed you in, in, in the early part of this lecture. So typically we start something around like 10 million years after the Big Bang approximation. This is the average 100, depending on what, 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 what cosmology you choose. Uh, if you want to run high resolution with simulation. In color you can start much later because color can make this extra step for you before, before you start doing really embody. So anyway, a very high redshift uh, really particle load is smooth, density contrast is small, so you're not going to make a uh, big mistake by using perturbation theory to move the particles and find the starting velocities and, uh, and the positions of the particles. So, that's why we use the Lagrangian perturbation theory. And if you have an embodied code that computes the forces and densities, you can use the same algorithm that computes the forces already to compute the, something we call displacement field that will move the particles according to what the perturbation theory tells us they should move. And the purpose of the Lagrangian perturbation theory is just otherwise known as Zeldovich approximation, meaning that we have Zeldovich mentioned earlier. So the idea is the following. You start, you have your Lagrangian positions and the uh, Eulerian particle positions X. Capital X are Eulerian, Lagrangian is like Q. So in Lagrangian space, you basically start with a uniform uh, particle load, and then you move them to Eulerian uh, frame by displacing them. And this displacement should reflect the cosmology of you. Basically, you take the power spectrum from CMB, it tells you what's the variance of the fluctuation and how uh, at given scales. So you, you choose your, your favorite cosmological models. You know what time at which you start, so you know how much you should move the particles, how much, times, how much time uh, passed from the initial particle load. And then so it's so, so the final position is basically initial position by the displacement field. The displacement field basically is just the D, capital D, which is a, the growing mode solution of the of the density, uh, Fourier density or, or not Fourier density evolution equation I showed you uh, earlier on. And uh, this is gradient of the peculiar evolutional potential. So if you have this part in the code already, it's very simple to compute this uh, as well. And then you can also find the velocities, which is x dot which is just the, the same gradient of the uh, vector additional potential multiplied by the growth mode, but now also you get the Hubble uh, function of given redshift, and this f is just the logarithmic derivative of this, of this growth, d. So you get d also from fixing the cosmology because you can now solve very easily the, the perturbation equations 
uh, and get this, this growing, growing one. So how do you proceed? Basically, you get the power spectrum. So if it's lambda CDM, you have plenty of cores that compute the lambda CDM power spectrum at an initial redshift. If you want to play around, you need to modify the power spectrum itself. Uh, for example, if you want to study some way of dark matter or hot dark matter or warm dark matter, you have some features on the power spectrum. Not that much on the power spectrum, you know what's the variance of the fluctuations. So now you need to have a Gaussian random number generator that draws phases and amplitudes. And basically, you represent this in the displacement field. So, you know, you, you have the grid, and you basically go out in the Fourier space, you know what will be the local representation of the fluctuations. That in the, is ensemble, one of the representation of the ensemble average of the power spectrum. But you always need to pick up peculiar phases, so that's why this initial random generator of Gaussian field need some kind of initial seed, right? Because you don't want to always have the same phases, otherwise you won't be able to do, for example, ensemble averages if you use the same box size and cosmology all the time. But once you have this, you get the displacement field, you, you, you displace the particles. Uh, okay, all right. So once you have the initial conditions, you can run all of this and, and, uh, and apologies for the lack. And have these nice results. But how it looks more in practice, basically, as I said, we start with the uniform grid. There's one of the ways. In, in past, there was something that was called glass initial conditions when the gravity was negative and it's supposed to have better properties. Nowadays, we don't need to use it because it's very cheap to compute second order regression perturbation theory. This is the first order. So you can compute second order, which is even better, give you better quality initial conditions. But anyway, some of all this is an isotopic. You take the CMB information in the power spectrum and compute the displacement and you displace the particles, right? C sorry. C again uniform. And this is displacement of the perturbation to remove how the particles should be moving during the particular representation of this power spectrum comes from CMB, you know. So you have some time in displacement, you have some but you get initial position, initial velocity. And basically, well, the way you do it normally is just uh, there's the full representation of the planar signatures, right? So, you know, you've seen this also uh, definition of the power spectrum, the general average of the density, Fourier density modes of the K. So, it's amplitude actually of this. Right? So, long wave means short wave and large amplitude, short wave and small amplitude, and this combines to somehow one dimensional uh, density field. Of course, we're normally going in three dimension. But you know, having the, the power spectrum allows you with the drawing the phases and the amplitudes to recreate the density fluctuations that is compatible with the, the input power spectrum, the one that you had here. Okay. So I have I think 15 minutes left, right? Yes. Before I get lynched publicly for taking too much time. So in the last 15 minutes, I will try to say a few words about once you, you know, get this idea how the speed more or less work, you don't know about your, your favorite code for computational cosmology in the structure simulation, generated initial conditions, you run the simulation, you wait patiently five days, five hours, and that's what computer you have, five months, sometimes five years, I don't recommend. Uh, and then you get some results. You might dictate in the code that your code should save the state of the universe you simulate every now and then. Sometimes you want hundreds, they call snapshots. Snapshots are basically just particle positions and velocities at a given time uh, you decided from the start of the simulation. So you might have snapshots like 100 snapshots from redshift 10 to 0. Then you have some kind of, a, you can follow also time evolution. And of course, you have these particles, and then you can compute a nice density, the millennial simulation of redshift 0, dark matter field. But what do you do? Okay, you can compute something about the dark matter uh, quantities itself using the particle load. This is very useful for if you want to study lensing. But if you want to do something with galaxies, you, if, and we so far discussed the gravity on the part, you would like to know where are the halos. Because you know galaxies live in halos, so where are the halos? Right? Everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So if you zoom in, you see that basically, you know, all this 
scales, you know, you have a rounded scale here, but inside that honey is smaller. It looks like a, like a actually, you know, small amount of flies flying around. And this is what the real high resolution simulation tells you. And this is what Kohlberg Mountain also model tells you uh, about the, this higher construction formation. So how to find these structures? And by the way, the hairs come of different shapes and different sizes. This is the family picture from the Copernicus complexity simulation. Coco, I will tell you more about this project that I worked on years ago on Friday. Uh, but basically, these are all halos that would have Milky Way-like mass, but you see they can have different amount of structure, different shape, and maybe different center density. So how we can find this objects? Because you know that an entire object if you want to study clustering and cooperate them with galaxies and so on and so forth. Well, for this use, how finding techniques, structure finding techniques, and that's the time chart. It's I see, it didn't stop updating after 2010, because it was very hard to follow this code. But basically, you have uh, this time evolution of different methods and different codes that were brought forward to solve this problem. So in the 70s, it was easy. It was one. Then it was two algorithms between the uh, decades of, from 80s to 90s. Eight, 30. Now I think it's a 50 or 60 codes. Uh, but most of them exploit the same, the same principle. So very quickly. Uh, basically, the two most widely used methods are the friends of friends algorithm. This algorithm takes the particle load, it takes one parameter, it's L, called linking length. It tells you, and linking length, by the way, is the dimensional, dimensionless parameter which is expressed by just some fractional of the interparticle separation. And on some simple physics, about gravitation, uh, this linking length is taken to be 0 0.2. And then, okay, we start with some particle, okay, I take this to be my value because it's close or equal to this linking length. All the guys that are far away are not my friends. Okay, I said I just got one friend. And then I go to one, I go to this friend, and I look again, okay, this, no, this guy I know, oh, this is my other friend, no more friends, I go here. Another thing, right? And basically, you create a linked list of particles that's called friends of friends, and you might find something like that. And of course, it's just a simplified picture. But these are not halos yet. These are called friends of friends groups. Why these are not halos will become uh, apparent very soon. Another approximation is, for example, spherical over density. density. Use one parameter density threshold, and you smooth the density of this particular simulation and find for the peaks and you try to find the center of the peaks, highest, and then you grow a sphere, and then you say, okay, this is a halo because it has some past some physical density threshold. It's a much more involved method. Uh, it's not very good, good if you have a very high dynamical range of your particle simulation because you need to pick this density threshold and density is a uh, quantity that, that really uh, depends on the resolution. But nonetheless, I think it's, it's physically motivated that gives you some kind of density. But here is just a linking link. But they also give you good, good hairs. Why friends of friends are not all hairs, but friends of friends, friends group is because of the bridging problem. So this FYP algorithm is very, very fast to implement. Basically, nowadays, most of the codes that are in simulations can do this on fly. So they, you know, evolve particle load. It's so cheap to find FYP groups, like they can still do it and these billions of particles being computed at the same time as the compute forces and potentials. Uh, but sometimes you have two halos close to each other, and they're just going to be bridged uh, by the fact that by pure chance these two particles were closer to the linking net, and you can get something like a doom bar like that, or I don't know, kind of a oddly shaped potato. So obviously, you, when you get the friends of friends catalog, you have to be very careful, and you probably take some human inspection because you might have problems like that. There are ways to to discover this very quickly. You just iteratively recompute the center of mass and you see that it moves very quickly and oscillates if you remove some particles. If you have just one group like that, if you remove this particle, the of mass doesn't change that much. But if you start, you know, throwing off. But it's just important to be in mind that many of the publicly available simulations data has this FOF catalogs. For each FOF group, you can compute some extra parameters like mass, virial mass, radius. But basically, they're usually blocks like that. And by the way, it also means that if you post-process simulation like that, and you want to compute the density profile in rows and spheres, you're going to hit 
the moment when you don't have more particles, not because there were no particles, but they were just not included in the group because they were uh, too far away. So usually, if you want to do it very correctly, you what you should do is go back to the original four particle snapshot and find these missing particles that might be here. So there are some problems, conceptual problems with this, but uh, it's very cheap and very fast library. That's, that's why it's very, very prevalent. That can be scales as well. Uh, well it's now, depending on the size of the resolution simulation, you can find from thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of dark matter halos. Right? This is a, just a slice of some simulations, uh, and you have different halo finding and find different halos in different parts. Uh, but you know, the fact that the halo finding is not so um, free of its problem uh, comes from a fact that halo boundary is defined as some kind of arbitrary. I mean, it's a density threshold. Usually we use the Biro theorem uh, applied to numbers in DM tells you that around when you go away from the halo and you move, get to the distance at which spherical average density drops to be 200 times the critical density for the universe, for the closure, it's pick, pick up to be like that, to be independent of the omega matter, then mostly you already should stop because if this scale, uh, if the halo is realized, this will be the kind of edge of the halo. But you know, with the lowest computing density on the particle load, it's noisy, so it's not so so straightforward. Uh, so I think this is what I covered here. And of course, you can bring up different uh, halo definitions. They can, you know, if you, if you have a and here, this is takes the exact real over density, which is computed for every cosmological model separately. R200 is fixed, it just takes the uh, critical density. R200 m, I think it's a median. So there are different ranges of which you can stop considering this to be a halo. And of course, you have different answers to the mass and the density profile. So you have to bear in mind what, what, what you do. But most of this definition just takes this delta as a as a limiting factor, and this can be either delta, uh, so over density, how many times some background density you reach uh, to consider this a halo edge. 200 is one of the common choice because it's independent of cosmology, you just have 200 times critical over density, but you can also have this uh, function of the uh, parameters, then you have a real over density, and to complicate things, this row might not be raw, critical might be also raw binary. So you have a, can have a 200 C, which is called delta 200 C is the critical over density times 200. Delta 200 M is the ma matter background density times 200 is a different density. So you know you can see obviously that we love complicated things in cosmology a lot, even with simple things like halos. But bear this in mind that if you pass along M 200, it might be M 200 C with critical density, or M200N, which is the background density times the omega matter. Uh, uh, now, just to show you that even though the finding halo looks quite straightforward, the answer is not so, uh, not so solid. So there was this very nice project run a couple of 10 years ago, Halos Go Mad, where there was a workshop close to Madrid, so organized by Alex Kneber, when he invited many people that wrote, wrote their own color finders, and then and then there was a simple, simple mind, a simple task in mind they had. They said, we're gonna give you all the same simulation. We run the simulation with one code, so all of you get the same particle loads, particle velocities. Find the halos and tell us what you codes and, and tell us where the halos are and what the halos are. And then I'll just show you one uh, example of how bad we are in respect to the precise cosmology because even though we run gravity only, very simple simulation, no baryonic matter, even though every different halo finders got the same particle load, this is the halo mass function. So basically the, this is the mass of the halo and how many halos of this mass you find in simulation, which is one of the fundamental uh, objects in modeling things in observables in cosmology, they cannot agree to 10%, sometimes even worse than 20%, but you know, a majority scatter is 10%. 10%, it's a huge number if you want to do 1% cosmology. 
So bear in mind that if you even someone says, okay, I have a modified gravity number that predicts that there should be 5% more clusters. Yeah? The lambda CTM predicts there could be 5% less or more clusters, right? So the simulations, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all in, the, in the, with the grain of salt in the eye of the holder. And I'm running out of my time, and I wanted to tell you how we can put the galaxies in there, even though we run only gravity uh, on the simulation. And then going to be my last few slides. So let's say we can find halos, whatever method you pick up. Uh, and then you also save your simulation in many, many times. So you have a you know, snapshot of not redshift 10, 9, 8, 8, 7.5. So usually you do it log logarithmic in time, because redshift is a logarithmic kind of a, a quantity. So you have a 100, 150, 50 if you don't have a big hard drive of 5, you have a very small hard drive snapshots. But you can analyze them. Why? And you can try to con find connection which halo merge with other halo. You can do this because every particle in our simulation can be given unique passport number. We call them ID numbers. And this helps us because particles are just in this, in this uh, basically they are the same. They, they are not unique. They have just some phase space masses. But if you give them IDs, you will know if you trace this particle with this given ID, what was its orbit, when it moved from the starting point to the final point, and then eventually you can also find halos that have the same particles between the snapshot. This allows you to build something we call merger trees. So basically this is just a description. We have some very massive halo at Reggie zero, and then we trace back, and then it, sh it shows that basically this halo had some merger here, no merger here, another two merge with that. And actually, if you go back in time, you sort of grow this kind of a tree-like structure. It tells you that this very massive halo started as some kind of, you know, 50 distributed halos and they all start to merge together. Of course, halos also get mass from the smooth accretion, but at least by following this, we can use these merger trees with, the, with the, some understanding of physics we know about the galaxy formation to understand what kind of a galaxy, to predict what kind of a galaxy should be put in these halos if we also would have variants. And these models are called semi optical models uh, of galaxy formation, SANS, or semi optical models for short. And this is a very smart way. You build physically motivated model that models all these mm, mm, physical processes that I will mention in a moment. But the only thing you need to have is just the input from the embody simulation, which is the merge trees. Only, plus all the model you have, right? Plus all these recipes, how quickly you form stars, what should be the size of the galaxy, when you change the color, how you form. Look, it's all complicated, but you can build a greatly motivated physical model. But basically, if you follow what happens with dark matter halos in the simulation, and also how the mass of these halos increase from some accretion, you can, you can model this process. Like first, you model info of the gas. Once the gas info from the, from the cosmic web, you basically uh, uh, heat the gas, right? Because the, the gas is, is compressed by the gravity, it's shock heated, it's, it's heated to regular temperature. But then you also can model cooling process because you have the physical, um, physical process that describes you the efficient time in which gas of this density and this temperature can radiate away its energy and start cooling down. Once you have a cool gas, you can start forming disks. And once you have a disk, you can start forming stars. If you have stars, these stars should you know, produce some energetic feedback because some of the stars will explode as supernovae. So this is feedback. Uh, and you can eject the gas outside of the halo. And some of the gas will just will be heated and go back to the hot halo. And then you can you know, follow the mergers. That's why you need the merger trees. If another dark matter halo comes inside this halo, it probably would have its own galaxy that came inside. So you can model ram pressure and tidal stripping that happens to this galaxy and also, you know, disruption of the disk, things like that. Finally, maybe you want to also model uh, active galactic nuclei, AGN and massive black holes. This is just a very, very simple sketch in a comic uh, book-like uh, style, I'll tell you, but these models are quite sophisticated. There are many of them are public in a code. So this means that even though you run very simple and cheap dark matter gravity only simulation, you can combine this with this model to get some kind of an informed, mm, empirically motivated 
But bear in mind, warning, just for numbers in the end, because I don't know of any model like that in construct of a lot of different cosmologies, galaxy formation model, which would tell you, okay, in local simulation you have 5 million of red galaxies, of red chip point five, you have 2 million of uh, blue galaxies, this is your magnitude, this is your morphology, this is how many disk galaxies you have. So actually you can go to the catalog of the dark matter halo, and now with this, you can find that in this halo, the model tells you there's a blue star forming galaxies that is this dominated, for example. And you can use this to, to do some more sophisticated uh, studies. And uh, I want to leave you with my take home messages. So computer simulations are essential tool for cosmology in the 21st century, no doubt. Uh, they are the closest thing we have to the control environment experiment in cosmology. But in a sense, bear in mind, they are not real experiments. They are very uh, sophisticated Gedanken experiment, like Einstein would say, right? You know, thought experiments that we just conduct using the computers. So with the ever so far growing power of computers, the simulations are becoming bigger and more accurate, but this also means it's harder to, to handle them. We can implement new physics and simulations and use the simulations for testing hypotheses. This is something we'll cover on Friday. Um, and we can learn a lot, I would say, about the universe by studying the virtual ones. Uh, in our computers. And thank you very much. And uh, I find your lack of questions very disturbing. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering for the friend of Frank Lackery, the, the yeah. leaking length is usually 0.2 or something like that. I was wondering about the meaning of the length. Like, how do you decide? Right. So it comes from the fact that if you have a, if you because it's it's uh, the leaking length. This leaking length is just the size of some delta times, uh, let's say, v, which would be interparticle separation. And indeed, the original friend-of-friend -friend algorithm that works on the position, which means it works in the position space, takes this delta to be 0 0.2. But if you do the calculations of the, what is the number over density, because it's, uh, you know, you, B is just, a, just a, B is just the number of particles in the region by the box size. So it's mean interparticle size all the way around. The box size by the number of particles in the region. So we call this mean interparticle separation. So 0 0.2 gives you, if you take it to the uh, volume, gives you over density that corresponds to 200, roughly. It to what, sorry? To correspond to 200, roughly. So it, it actually so actually it's, not, it's 110, it's an original bureau of over density for halos. So it's just, a, just a reflecting the fact that if you express the distances in the unitless as interparticle separation, the box size, you make it every unitless, then 0 0.2, if you take the, this to the third power, should correspond to the, if you take the particles inside, to the over density of the 110 or something like that, which is the original bureau of over density from the from the Einstein the Sitter model, something like that. Yes. So it's just a numerical trick. But by the way, bear in mind that if you would have a different model, probably adjusting that this 0 0.2 would be would be in place. And also maybe I mentioned in passing that there are further adjustments and improvement to the friend of friends, which is a friends of friends phase space. So no longer you link in the position but also in velocities, which is nice because sometimes you have a you know, one halo moving through the other halo, and they are, you know, just happen to be in the same space uh, in, the, in the universe, but they have completely different velocities. And you can find this difference by doing friends of friends in space, phase space. But then you need to adapt completely different uh, interparticle separation modification. Um, thank you for the great talk. I have two, um, two questions. Um, the first one is um, regarding this. Um, um, gravity only model. Um, I'm wondering um, how much we can say about uh, stellar properties like luminosity and so on. Right, so I only managed to, to touch upon this a little bit, like with this 
very, very quick sketchy uh, uh, presentation of modeling like that. So we have to bear in mind that in a gravity only simulation, we have gravity only, and we have some kind of a clumps of clustering. We basically know where the potential wells uh, are in the Velasquez structure. So the only if you want to put stars there somehow, you have to bring much, much more information. You have to settle down on some kind of an understanding of how the stellar populations evolve in the galaxy. So this is very, very much involved. So this models, I mean, this is really sketchy, but there are just tons of literature about how to do this. Uh, how they're actually solving a uh, couple of differential equations, right? And try to follow stellar population. The problem is that once you start doing this, you have so many free functions that relates to the star formation, uh, galaxy formation physics, then you need to somehow anchor them. And the problem I know from SAMS, at least from my perspective, is that, for example, you want to have a model that recreates redshift one uh, submillimeter galaxy population, or you know, low surface brightness galaxy population. Or you have some target, observation galaxy population, you have simulation, you, you, you try to find the best Three functions and parameters for this, all these you know, uh, processes that give you the right uh, answer that matches the observation with the simulation. And then, oh, you say, great, I found some. Now you use the same uh, parameters, and then you find that completely you have too much, you know, too many red galaxies on red zero, for example. Or you never find proper Milky Way. So the problem is that, you know, these are very useful, but also very narrow minded. No, no, there are not single sem semiconductor galaxy formation model that would be explaining every galaxy population we have. So you have to use different one if you want to study you know, red versus blue galaxies, different one if you want to study you know, dusty galaxies at high redshift. The other way to do just stellar maybe population, so which is called stellar mass to halo mass relation, is the, something we use, we call uh, abundance matching, which is much simpler than this. Abundance matching tells you that Okay, you have some observed galaxy population with this luminosity, so this star masses, and you have some dark matter halo catalog in the simulation, and you take the biggest halo and the biggest galaxy, and then the slightly smaller halo, slightly less stellar mass and mass galaxy, and you start putting one to the other. Eventually, you run out of galaxies. If you run out of halos, you have a problem because then your simulation is not accurate enough. But if you run out of the galaxies, then you say, okay, that's what the halos I throw away, they didn't have the galaxies I wanted to observe. But these are all very phenomenological models, so, uh, as I said, depends what you want to do, but you won't get a, uh, any clean information on stellar population from the model You need to add this extra information either from observation or from the galaxy formation models. Um, yes, but well, um, how uh, are we going to, how, how can we test this dark matter only model since there are basically only light that comes to us? Right, and so, it's, it's, okay, very good question. So at some point, you understand that the galaxies live in halos. So as I said, you might use this matching, saying that, you know, uh, I can recreate observed galaxy catalogs using dark matter only uh, simulations, but I will always be left with some halos that don't have galaxies because I run out of the observational data. And this is kind of a trade. If you want to test just the dark matter part, then you need to look for different observables, like lensing, for example, because lensing responds to the total potential, not only to the, the one that shines in light in galaxies. So, and this is also something what we did. So people took the dark matter only simulation, put the ray tracing, compute the potential for lensing, and then show, uh, and then went to observations that always respond to the full dark matter, uh, full matter law. Uh, so basically, lensing is uh, done by both baryons, so bright, and dark matter mass distribution. We observe some lensing, we can calculate the statistics like convergence power spectrum or shear power spectrum. There's some way how much light is bended by the last structure in the distribution of the universe. And then you go to simulations and you compute the same and they, they agree. So we know that the dark matter distribution is compatible with observations. Even though we don't have light in the dark matter in the simulation, but we have potential.
I don't know if I answered your question right now. Yes, um, thank you. And then I have another one. Um, see, um, so you can find these um, halos um, during, um, in these simulations. Um, but I'm wondering, um, you know, when you have a, a big halo and it's fragmented into smaller halos. So um, which one of these halos would you find? Well, that's another step because I just mentioned halo finding is also a very good question. But obviously, once you consider that we have cold dark matter in standard model of cosmology, this is hierarchical structure formation model. So this means that by definition, one of the pictures I show you, you won't only find halos, right? And last structure structure find some halos here, bigger, smaller. But when you have you zoom in and you look, of course, you should have also smaller guys inside, right? But this is a different problem, it's called sub-halo finding. So we first find halos, and this is the first approach, and I mentioned that. And halos are good enough if you want to study, for example, central galaxy population. But if you want to have satellites, if you want to also find sub-halos, then you take this initial dark matter catalog of halos, two, three, four, and use different algorithms to post-process, because you can't use friends of friends. And why? Because you are already inside halo, you are already inside high density region. And you know, density inside halos vary very dramatically. We know that they follow something called Navarro Frank White profile. Basically, it's a power profile. So, density grows very quickly towards the center of the halo. So, this means that you have sub halo that is close to the center. It's much harder to find because it still comes very barely above the density of the halo than the the same subhalo that is close to the edge. Because the density here, if this is the, let's say, the middle radius of the halo, drops from the 10 to the 6 at one, around roughly 1% 1 of the real radius to, to, let's say, 200 at the real radius, right? So you have a total of magnitude here, change in density. So subhalo finding is a, is a different art. And um, one way to do this is to do this phase space, like, like some of the others, one of them is called Rockstar, so you, you look for the you know, distribution of these clumps, in also taking into account velocities. The other is, for example, like subfine algorithm that try to compute the potential and find the way that if you have a sub halos, then you would have something like that from time to time, right? So small peaks. I mean, there's also this, but then, so basically you find the kind of a subtle points, in the distribution of the density, and you cut here, and then you suspect, suspect there's a subhale. But uh, you touch upon a very big problem. It's 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 complicated. We have subhale finding algorithms, but they are much less. Well, they're much more prone to scatter than the halo finding. So if halo finding had 10 percent variance, I showed you the, the mass function. You don't want to know what the subhale mass function looks like, but uh, it's bigger discrepancy. So it's a problem. Plus, the number of subhalos you can find depends very strongly on resolution. Right? So uh, it's, it's a complicated problem, and, but we have ways to attack this, but we have to be careful. I think this is the best answer I can give you. Thank you. You had a remark that you didn't like glass initial loads because it's something to do with 2LPT. Uh, can you enlarge on that? Does that mean you, you like using initial grids despite their emptiness? No, no, I didn't say I don't like it. I said it, it, it stopped being using uh, so uh, commonly because now it's cheap. It's very cheap to go to second order Lagrangian perturbation theory. Uh, but but, but you, that that generates displacements, but you still need an initial power. Yes. So what 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 do you recommend if it's not glass? Well, you can agree, yes, but it, it depends. I think it depends on the starting redshift you want to go. Glass is definitely better if you go to high redshift. Well, I mean, people stopped using grids because you had obvious artifacts in the voids. Yes. Uh, so if you're interested in, in low density regions, you yes. have something that suppresses those. That's true, because you have very small displacement there. It's pretty bad for warm dark matter. It's also pretty bad for warm dark matter, that's true. Yeah, so I guess I have nothing against glass. I just mentioned that basically glass was originally uh, considered uh, one of the uh, ways to, to, to compute the, well, start from the initial particle law, basically move the particles back in time, have a negative gravity. 
and then, then you don't have uniform width, you actually have this, that's why you name glass, right? Like in glass you have these domains when the particle move. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a good remark. Uh, I use myself glass for cognitive complexity, so I don't know why I made this remark. Maybe you caught me off guard here. Yes, indeed, this is an important point. So if you start with this initial particle load, it's actually even visible here. Uh, one of, uh, let me do it slowly because. Yeah. Right, if you do this, then obviously you will understand that, you know, in the low density regions, you have a very small displacement here. And then once you progress in time simulation like that, these particles tend to have them remember this initial memory of the grid because they only experience very small dynamical evolution in the low density region. In high density, it's not a problem because you know quickly overtaken by the true dynamics. So if you start with the this is the particle load that comes from the grid and initial position. So you might have this problem. So I didn't touch upon the glass, maybe because I think uh, well I had some limited amount of time to do this. But it's a very, very good remark, John. Thank you. I had one question uh, regarding like the, these initial conditions. So, uh, okay, maybe I'm confused a lot. So, the, the density perturbations which I take for, let's say, structure formation and all, there I am perturbing the, because, okay, if, if lambda CPM is the model, then I know the metric is FLRW. So, initial conditions are on that metric. Those initial conditions are the same for the Lagrangian which we, I start with, like the, well, we don't have, uh, in the simulation, we don't work on the metric anymore. This is all taken account, taken away because of the background. We actually have, well, it's, it's Euclidean space, it's pseudo Minkowski, maybe if you want to really push it forward. So it means that, you know, all the metric is happening on the background, and locally we just have this uh, Euclidean space in which I displace the, the, the particles to represent the local density fluctuations. And of course, it's not very really cautious, it's phenomenological, but it will be shown that uh, you don't need to follow metric perturbations uh, precisely, like in that simulation, you can get away with it, provided you're limited to your interest to, to, you know, to relatively large effects. And the GR is very, are very tiny effects in the structure. Probably not measurable, depends who you ask, but uh, you know. Uh, so this is the, the, the Friedman, Friedman equation happens in the background. It was here. Uh, um, we just take the we just take the power spectrum and then create a distribution, displacement, phases, and amplitudes that is one of the potentials that's called uh, the representation of such a power spectrum of density fluctuation. All those waves that contribute. 